My name is Alan Grant. I'm an econ professor at Baker University. And my first point of contact with students is actually not in the principles of econ course, but is in a course we have for freshmen, largely non-majors, called the Economic Analysis of Social Issues. And, and that's the course that I'd like to talk about a little bit today. Um, we get a lot of students. Uh, in particular, um, we get mass media students. We have a lot of education students who are interested in economics, um, want economics to be part of their general education program, but really don't care a lot about things like short-run average variable cost curves and other things that you might explore in a traditional principles course. And so they come to economic analysis of social issues to get some background okay. and some insight into some things that they really that care the about. The um, they wonder why there are so many problems uh, in the world and why it seems so difficult to solve them. And this course is where we address some of those things. I structured the course around a very, very simple framework of game theory. Um, we start the semester with two player, two strategy games. We extend that just a little bit to multiplayer games, but all of our game theoretic work is over within the first two or three weeks of class and we spend the rest of the time applying what we've learned. And I think this is really critical to an understanding of social issues. We can't talk about all the problems in the world, there's just not enough time in a semester or in a lifetime to do that. Um, but my job in the classroom is to show these students that many of the problems that we're concerned about share the same sort of fundamental structure, and game theory is a really nice analytical toolkit to do. And our donors. We start the semester um, by talking about everything that markets in particular do right, about the great value that is created when people are allowed to buy and sell and truck and barter and exchange with one another. And we really like to spend a lot of time building up that straw man, and then we spend the rest of the they semester tearing it down piece by piece. Markets do amazing so things when they work well, but it turns out that many of our biggest social problems are problems that exist when markets do not function properly um, because of uh, externalities, positive or negative, because of insecure property rights, because of transactions costs, because of asymmetries of information. And so the beef of our course is step by step by step talking through some important social problems and showing why those problems result from a failure of markets to deliver on their promises in some way, shape, or form. And I've taken this course in social problems and really turned it into a hands-on learning environment for students. Um, in each of the 15 weeks of our semester, we participate in one big, large-scale simulation. Uh, these simulations are designed to mimic some particular kind of social problem. So we do a simulation explaining or designed to, to show students why whooping cough is coming back why people tend to pollute, why communism failed, why it's so difficult to find enough organ donors. Very Students very participate very in these yeah. things every week. Um, they end up being part of the grade. In fact, students participating in these simulations, I pay them uh, for how well they do in these simulations with a, an artificial unit of classroom cash that I call the ducat. At the end of the semester, uh, they get to use their accumulated pile of ducats to buy part of their grade. This sort of makes the simulation real for them. It encourages them to participate. It's been one of the great rewards for me to see that students that don't do well in traditional learning environments, they don't do well on multiple choice exams, or they don't write well. Um, but as often as not, the ducat king at the end of the semester, the person that accumulates the largest pile of cash is someone who doesn't particularly do well in traditional venues. These experiments are all one version or another of collective action experiments. Um, and the collective action experiment in my class is largely just a big multiplayer prisoner's dilemma um, where individual interests are at odds somehow with what's in society's best interest. And it's my job over the course of the semester to show how those misaligned incentives um, create many of the social problems that our students are concerned about. We start the semester with a simulation designed by a friend and colleague of mine, Jim Bruler at Eastern Illinois University. It's called the Red-Green Simulation, 
and it asked students almost a ridiculous question. It asked them to get together and choose, uh, choose a signature color. They can choose red or they can choose green. And the more students who choose red, the higher the payoff to the group. However, individuals have a dominant strategy of choosing green. Despite the fact in this experiment, there are potentially millions of ducks at stake. Students tend to walk away with a few hundred at the end of this simulation. Jim's experiment is designed in a context-free way to show how misaligned incentives create poor outcomes. Uh, we do this experiment very early in this semester, and as the semester unfolds, we begin to wrap context around this experiment. One of the first ones that we do is uh, an experiment designed to show how the incentives created in a communistic society where the product is shared equally among all producers. Um, how those create incentives not to work as hard as one might in a capitalist society where you get to keep the entire product of your work ethic. And one of the things that I really, really love uh, about the red green simulation and about doing these other simulations are what I call the light bulb moments. Uh, invariably, after we finish the communism and capitalism simulations, somebody looks up and they go, oh, this is red green again, isn't it? And it's exactly what I want to do. I want to show them that a lot of our problems share the same fundamental structure with many of the other problems, that there are unique things that link these problems to one another. Um, and it's uh, kind of a magical moment when students make those connections. When I'm implementing my simulations, I use clickers. And the clicker is a wonderful thing. And I know lots of people use clickers for drill or for multiple choice quizzing, or they pepper their lectures with questions regarding clickers. And I do some of that. But I found that the clicker is an ideal way to implement these large scale simulations. Um, in particular, in a simulation where a student has only one choice, I'm going to work hard, or I'm going to slack off, I'm going to choose red, I'm going to choose green. Uh, they can enter a binary response very, very quickly. I can show the display on the screen. We can immediately tabulate the results, and without having to wait for a lot of paper shuffling and tabulation and entering numbers in Excel, we can immediately repeat the experiment so that students get a little bit of experience. All semester long, 15 of these simulations, they're major events for students to participate in. And the best part is, they're fun. Um, students get a kick out of doing them. They get a kick out of seeing the results. It's nice for me to watch these experiments unfold. And they can see that the theory that we've spent time developing on the, on the whiteboard actually gets put into practice in a meaningful way. At the end of the semester, um, I do an entire semester recap. I call it Grant's Last Stand. We go through the semester experiment by experiment by experiment and draw the critical links one more time between all of the simulations that we have done. Uh, and at the end, one of my favorite things to do is to talk to students about their behavior during these experiments. Because you remember that the goal of these experiments is to show why we have so many social problems and why these problems are so difficult to solve. And I like to talk with my students and tell them that over the course of 15 weeks and over the course of 15 simulations, um, in a classroom where you sat with your classmates and your friends and you had repeated contact with these people and you became a community of learners together, you looked one another in the eye and you told one another you were going to cooperate and do the right thing and then you screwed one another over for imaginary money. 256 bucks, you could have earned two and a half times what you're earning right now. And instead, what are you walking away with? A hundred bucks. And if you're willing to screw one another over for imaginary money, and you're willing to screw over your friends and your classmates for imaginary money. Imagine how you're going to behave when the money is real and the person you're screwing over is half a world away in some far distant land. I think the toolkit that we build using some very, very basic game theory and spending a semester showing how you can wrap context around these game theoretic experiments, how these experiments share the same structure time after time after time, um, gives them something that empowers them after the course is over, something that they'll remember after the course is over, and you know, most importantly for me, um, something that might draw them back to an economics classroom for a little bit more study.